Good morning. What an honor it is to be able to stand before y'all one more time. I've had, a, I've had a great teaching in the past six months. It, uh, it taught me something I, uh, I wouldn't have thought I could have ever been taught. Six months, uh, can y'all hear me? Six months ago, I had, uh, had some pain going on, and I thought, this is a kidney stone. So it, it wasn't a full-fledged pain like a kidney stone. Has. Who's, who's ever had a kidney stone in here? Man. God can, God can allow you to raise a kidney stone if you're careful. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Six months ago, I went and I was having my problem. Uh, X-ray wouldn't show kidney stones, so your obviously suggested that I can set you up at the hospital and so get a CT stone search. I thought, I don't want to fool with that stupid hospital. A person gets sick going there. So uh, I just took it. I didn't have a kidney stone. He didn't say one. He didn't think I had one. So uh, as time kept going, the more the the more pain I was, I was going through over this past six months, several times I just, uh, I'd stop the truck, just get out and just, just double over beside the truck and beside the road and, and pray the pain in the past for God to come get me. Talked to my doctor about it. He said, there's no kidney stone. He says, uh, we're going to have to start looking at, at your intestinal tract. So it's, uh, I was off the last two weeks. So the first Monday I was off, I set up to go uh, to a gastrologist, and I've done been treated for colitis. Uh, they, they either got a blockage of tumor or diabetes colitis. And I know something that hurt that bad, you ain't gonna live through if it ain't a kidney stone. And uh, I mean, I just, my mind, I mean, I've been, it's been a hard last three months, a very hard last three months. Because if you've ever had a kidney stone attack, imagine five or six times a week. And uh, it just gets where your kidney gets inflamed and it starts wanting to eject, eject, eject every time you try to pull, push, pull, bend. I wind up uh, two Thursdays ago, I had to, had to stop and move my route. I thought I was going to call the ambulance out. The stop molten, called the uh, call Terry and dad was there and they said, hey, let's come get you. I said, no, nah, so let's try to make it in. Somebody had to come get the truck and all the freight. I made it back in and made it to the emergency room. And uh, <clears throat> I hate emergency rooms with a passion. Uh, but I was, I was very blessed that day that my ex daughter mom was there and she saw fit that I needed not only one shot of morphine, but two. And uh, so time didn't matter much no more how long I was there. But the CT scan, it showed kidney stone. And uh, folks, I thank God for a kidney stone. Of all the alternatives I've read and talked to my doctor about kidney stones, was the far best option I thought. Let's get this, I'm a pro at this. I can deal with kidney stone with the best of them. I've done, had about 15 of them busted, give birth about 20, 25 of them. God, God can touch you in a way, or you can lie and condition, condition you in a way. I would wish a kidney stone on my worst enemy. I would not. I wouldn't wish it on a Democrat either. I would not wish it on Nancy Pelosi. But I thank God for a kidney stone. And it's gone, and praise God, I feel better. You run into people and you say, oh, so-and-so, they love a good steak. So-and-so, they, they love good entertainment. Glenn Free used to, he'd sit there about where he ain't just sitting at it. He'd say, man, I love a good singing. And uh, it, we know people like things, a lot of times about things they love. Louis loves a good short joke. <laughs> All right, God's filling you down a little bit of time, baby. One day we'll be out of here. Uh, I love the parables. I can't.
cannot get away from at this point in time in my spiritual life. I'm, I'm drawn to him. I ask God for it's a deeper understanding of his word. If you just think about this, in Matthew chapter 13, there's eight parables called the kingdom parables. Right there. I'm just going to two or three, but you got the parable of the soil with the dirt, with the stony dirt, rocky dirt, uh, infested ground dirt, or fertile dirt. The parable I'm going to cover today is the parable of the tares. And this, we're the wheat. There's other parables that goes below them. I, I dig into them. Imagine yourself sitting down with Jesus and the disciples and the other believers and having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You can ask, but Jesus, what did that mean? As a believer, as a believer, a parable is a one-on-one -on -one with Jesus in a personal setting and a personal teaching. I was thinking this morning, I sat on my back porch every morning, I drank coffee, I feed the dog, and uh, we got three chickens that are still alive. And I throw chickens and dog food, I watch them pay, eat and scratch the dog, I just enjoy quiet time, ask God, Lord, what can I do today, or there's something you got in front of me, to word, which direction in me to go, but God help me put myself aside, I mean, there's a I have almost a daily, regular prayer that I go through while I sit out there on on back porch. Well, when I get in the evenings, I'm out there on the back porch. It's a 40-foot long by a 14-foot wide cement slab covered. I'm out there on the garden hose, and I'm spraying chicken poop off of it. Every morning, I come across it. I don't mind y'all chickens. I don't mind y'all eating up here. But take you pooping in the grass. <laughs> My dogs that saw me complain about it, they, they pretty much will go eat it every chance they can, but they leave the nasty stuff. So I follow a chicken, just from all comical entertainment, I follow a chicken around. Are you going to poop? Go out there and poop. I saw you eat and saw you drink. But y'all come on out here. I'll shield them off. I'll squirt them with water. Try to get them to keep from pooping on my back, back porch. The chickens don't understand what I'm saying. They're, they're drawn by the food and the water. I'm fussing, complaining, and try to teach them a correct place to go to the bathroom at. I can teach them proper edifices about uh, bathroom use. <laughs> but they're never going to understand me. Purpose of a parable. If y'all go to, I got I got two uh, introductions to the purpose of a parable. One in Matthew and one in Mark. I like the one in Mark just a little bit better because it includes Jesus the twelve and other believers. All right, go to chapter thirteen in Matthew. We pick up in verse ten. And the disciples came and said to him. Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given, it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And he who, who has abundance, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear or understand. Uh, just the times, the times they got the over. Mark 4, <clears throat> 10, 11, and 12. This is another description. But when he said, he was, uh, but when he was alone, those around him, and with the 12 asked uh, let me get that right. But when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about parable. He said to them, Do you, it has been given to know 
the mission of the kingdom of God. But to, but to those who are outside, all things come in parables. My chickens don't get the parable. They don't understand what I'm telling them. So when we, when we look in, in the Word of God and we come across a parable, I was so uh, arrogantly misconceived because I would explain a parable as something I heard somebody say and I thought sounded really good and intelligent. It's an earthly story with a godly meaning. Let me rephrase that. It's a personal lesson to me in my spiritual walk and in my spiritual life from Jesus Himself. I've studied this. I've listened to it preached on several different, uh, several different places with several different people. It only truly registers to a Christian when you will take time to get along with Jesus. And you will study and you will ask Him, God will build to me the secrets of your work. It just says, I give you the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. What good is it if He gives it to us and we don't take it and we don't ingest it and we don't take time to apply it to our lives and we don't take time to live it in front of other people and to share it. Bow your heads, please. Heavenly Father, may I go to heaven and say, God, uh, Lord, you said no fire with this parable a year ago. Lord, can not get away from it, Father? I, I love them. I love the way you reveal yourself to me when Lord, the time is right in my life. Lord, the time is Lord, I don't want to give no opinions about nothing. Lord, I just want to open your word up and explain to you, Father, or explain to the church and everybody I come in contact with, God, how you bless me. Father, how you take a daily walk from time to time. Father, you teach me such a godly meaning. Father. Lord, you can change. God, a rainy day in the sunshine, Father. Lord, how you can just, you can take a day that we're so beat up, Father, when we're so worried and we're so concerned, Lord, or we're in so much physical pain, but you take a day of just a moment out of your time, Father, and reveal yourself to us in a way, Father, that actually relates to physical pain. God, I'm a testimony to you. Please don't let me get in the way of nothing, Father, please have your way. Amen. One of the worst days, uh, the week before, I had to go emergency room. I was making some deliveries. I, I hate residential deliveries. You can't get in their place. You can't get out of them. Uh, everyone will tell you, you call them, they can get a truck in. Yeah, they come in here all the time. You get back there and you're an 18-wheeler, and I said, oh, I thought you said UPS. I said, no, ma'am, I explained I had 18 wheels, a truck, and a 53-foot trailer. You said I could turn around. Well, I'm sorry, but you have my delivery, don't you? You can back out, can't you? That, that, that's just a daily thing. That, that's part of my job, so I take that with stride. I had a day I was hurting so bad. And I was, it was a struggle. It's, it's, it's just trying to breathe easy. Three weeks ago, had a residential delivery at the end of a dirt road. I bypassed twice before I could get to it, and barely get turned into it. I mean, imagine I'm in I'm a 53 foot trailer. I get down there, and there's a guy who has a flag. It's a great big old field. It's a, some guy in Russell on about five or six big cattle ranches. It was addressed to him as going to it place where he had one man out there. He just ranks him. So I finally can get turned around. He, he gets a little poor living on those. And it's all I'm going to get this big thing pushed to the back. I'm hurting so bad. And uh, I finally get down. He, he's got it. And 
this this man he was a wishful think of a Tony T. Hall song he sang about the, the guy was so, the cowboy was so skinny that he couldn't hardly cast a shadow but he put a knife up against his ear. I wish I think this 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 gentleman was a sixty something year old ranch hand. Uh, tall and slender. I mean he was skinny. I had uh, had a big old pistol on his on his side. I said, man, I said, you got to find us. You live in a dream. You're a paid cowboy. He said, I work. I, I was in the service. I was uh, worked at this fabrication place. He said, this is what I've always wanted to do. He said, I just love being a ranger. It's so nice. I said, well, I got to ask you something. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm just, I'm just like doubling over. If you had a kidney stone, you know. I said, let me ask you something. I said, you know, Lord. Jesus says you saved her. I said, because you got such a pleasant demeanor. I said, uh, I just want to know if, uh, if you're a child of the king. This old boy teared up. He said, I've been waiting on somebody to ask me that. At that particular time, I had no more pain. I had I had goosebumps. That mom, I said, God, thank you. You brought me to the place I need to be. I heard a preacher preach one time. He says, no place, any other place like this place so this must be the place. I found the place that day to have a Christian fellowship, made a lifelong dear friend that I'm in contact with and I'll stay in contact with. This man blessed me way more if I could bless him just a testimony. God knew what I needed, when I needed it, and what I needed to go to get it, and how I needed to conduct myself in a man to be open and receive him. Guy's name is Delvin. One finest man I ever met in my life. I asked her to add him to your prayer list. He desires prayer because he wants to live godly as he possibly can for as long as he's got there. And he's sincere about it. Back to the parable. We've got to be in that place. And I said, there's no place like this place, any other place. This must be the place. That is the place that God wants you to get when you study in His Word. Because that's the place that He can minister to us the best. So as believers, we always got to be seeking a place to be alone with Jesus. All right, listen to this parable. You all, you all know this parable. The parable of weak and tears. Another parable he put forth to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who has sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. You know, uh, he went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came to him and said, Sir, did you not sow good seeds in the field? How then does we have tares? He said to him, An enemy done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both of them grow together to the harvest. And the time of the harvest, we'll say to the reapers, first gather the tares and burn them in bundles. Uh, bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather wheat into my barn. God is the owner of the field. He has sown what oh, he's sown. He has sown wheat. In the field is the world. God has taken this world and he has sown wheat in this world. When people look, he applies, you ask us about your everyday life, where, where you work, the family, uh, sometimes churches. How did the how did the weeds get in here? Well, he explains, he says the enemy comes and plants them at night. 
I've looked at pieces of wheat and tear. I can't tell them apart. Uh, they have to be, uh, for our bread, they have to be mature. And one produces wheat grain and another one don't. But they sent both, both plants compete for the same water, the same nutrients, the same ground, and the intent of the wheat being, the tares being mixed in with the wheat, that she burn the field and get rid of all of it. Now we're, we're believers, so we're the wheat. What does he tell, what does he tell the wheat, what does he tell the servants that the wheat needs to do? The wheat needs to sit there and grow and feed wheat and produce wheat. That's us. We're planted in a field that, that tares is planted, been, been planted in with us. They look like us. They smell like us. They may attend the church we go to. They may be in the place we work. But Count this, for God sows wheat, Satan sows tares. So I see, the, I see the servants is doing the same thing as what my general knee-jerk instinct would be. Well, let's get rid of the tares. God says, no, that's not your job. Let me just add to it. Your job is to be wheat, because that's what I planted you to be. I want you to be a wheat, I want you to be strong wheat, I want you to be good wheat. I want your wheat to produce other seeds that not only people may eat from, but may be planted in another field. Never mind the tares. It's not your job. And he goes on to explain. We've got an explanation in here in just a second. I got people for the tares. I got a plan for the tares. Just let them grow and mature. We can't go up to somebody and say, based on my biblical knowledge, you're a tare. Oh, why don't you say I'm a tare? Because you don't agree with me. Because you don't do this, you don't do that. Pulling the tare up. Uproots the wheat inside of it, therefore damaging. In a church, if, if, if Brother John had a problem hearing somebody needed to be disciplined or voice uh, the big turn off when you're interviewing a pastor, uh, I let God do the pruning. I just point it out to him. Mm -hmm. I'm done talking at that point in time. You know? And I've heard it. I heard I went to church and I cleared that off the bad people. We grew a new church. It's not your job. Minister, you minister to everybody. Well, I ain't a pastor at one of the churches. I heard one guy, he said, you do things my way. If I suggest it, he said, I give the most money. He said, I give three times more than anybody up in this little church and her. The little congregation and take over two hundred dollars a week. I said that don't amount to nothing to me, Mister. All right, going on. See what I haven't got to do in the past world. We're gonna go. All right, let's uh, let's turn over and move the uh, parable explained. Uh, that'll be next page over, verse thirty-six. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and, uh, and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares in the field. He answered them, He who sows good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked. <coughs> the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age, and reapers are angels. Therefore, as tares are gathered and burned into the fire, so it will be the end of age. <coughs> the, son, the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out in his kingdom 
all things are defended. And those who practice lawlessness will be cast into the furnace of fire. They will be waiting a uh, gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, they will hear. So, what do, what do I take from what God has uh, burdened my heart with this? Don't worry about the tares. They're in God's hands. Spend my time being a faithful stalk of wheat, a good Christian, a good believer. Know it. Know it above all things beyond any shadow of doubt that God is teaching us right here. This is in His hands. It's not in ours. And if we go and try to recultivate the wheat field that God has planted and Satan is infested with, wheat, uh, with weeds, we're going to do more damage than we can do good because we don't have the inside of knowing who is a tear and who is a weed. All we can go by is what we see out of somebody's life when we're around them. And we can be set next. We can be set next to wheat. We can be set next to tares. We work with wheat and tares. Uh, leave that stuff up to God, who has angels, who says, "One day I will send them, and they'll gather them dum dum uh, the, the tares." Sorry, say Democrat. They're gathering them tares. <laughs> Said, Lord, don't let me have them. God's good at what He does. His wheat is us. His field is this world. He gives us a charge: go and be fruitful. How we do it? We look back to the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Kindness, gentleness, love, compassion, mercy, a slow to speak, slow to anger, quick to listen. Uh, we've got all kinds of things that do good things that we know that we're doing good. If we get busy spending time with God, ask Him to give us a personal revelation for our life and how we can go about our life to be a better servant for Him at that one time, if we sell out to Him in faith, our life becomes productive for Him and produce some fruit. You're not going to be a fruit producer for Christ until you completely sold out to Him and say, okay, Lord, what's my direction in my life? Lead me, convict me, show me, bridle me. Give us, I know Doug, he hates the horse of me Horses don't like rivals. They make them go places they don't want to go. Ask God to bridle your tongue, bridle your mouth. Ask Him to hold your thoughts pure and honorable. Don't assume you have the position given to you by God that we can cloak terror. We're not smart enough. We're not strong enough. We're not holy enough. Only God is. The purpose of a parable in this particular thing is to teach me. Danny spend more time with me. You can go out and do everything that you think is on, on the agenda for your life. Win souls to Christ. Preach. Teach, witness. He said, You got to understand my word first. He said, You got to understand my word first. He says, I am the word. I need to be inside of you. How can I be a productive Christian in my life for Him 
not my self glorification. Now I can sit here and take a pair of scissors and cut the grass, spend all my life putting grass up here, and say, you see me, you see me, hey, look, you look at me. You know, I can I can do all that, but that won't get me nothing but sore knees and sore hands if I'm not doing it for the glory of God and not me. Parables are deep teaching. You find you one, get into it. Beg God for understanding. Trust me, don't come back disappointed. Uh, one good Two fellows I, I really I love dearly, Brother Larry's passed on. When they had won people to Christ, they tell them, say, first thing I want you to do, because everybody wants to know how you study the Bible, how you say, how you come to the Lord, how, you, how can I know his work? How hard is Larry said? He said, you take the book of John, and said you read it three times. He said you get familiar with Jesus in the book of John. So then you go and you read Romans. And said so you get familiar with what's happened to the Roman road of salvation. They said, when, you, when you've got that done, they said, most people will start from the Old Testament and go all the way through. They said, mm -hmm. said, then go back to Matthew. They said, read the first or the New Testament. They said, you get a grasp on it. They said, then you can start to study the Old Testament. I say find you some parables. Jesus taught the disciples one on one. The world was not privileged to God's holy word at this time. Unbelievers would never understand it. Unbelievers are going to be like the chickens on the back porch. They're not going to know a word I say. But a believer will have a hunger for them to know more about God's word. So have we become effective Christians? Sell our, sell our whole soul to the Lord. And say, teach me God. It's never our place to judge. It's never our place to condemn. Our place to be a good and faithful stalk of wheat and produce seeds that others benefit from. Invitations is if you're struggling, if you're struggling to see what the Lord has in store for you, don't sit up and ask for a sign. Get in God's Word. Apply it to your life. And once you get into God's Word and apply it to your life, you need to start watching. Your life affects other people. As long as we're busy worrying about the cares in this world, we're in a stunning state of spiritual growth. Trust in God and He's got all of some control. That's all I got. Thank you all. Thank you, Danny. Danny Bain, would you come and lead us in our hymn of invitation during this time? Where God speaks to us as we share it, as we teach it, as we preach it, as we sing it. How has it spoken to your heart today? God's touched your heart. God's leading you and guiding you through His Word. As we sing this song, this is an invitation to you to respond to God, not to Danny or to me or to anyone in our church. What does God want you to do today? How does He want you to get closer to Him?